Now, I don't know, have you guys, has anyone here ever seen Iron Chef? Yeah? Okay, so you guys know what you're talking about. I actually have never seen the show. But I think it goes something like this. We give all of the participants an ingredient. And this was an ingredient that they actually picked uh, from a list of ingredients that they came up with. And the challenge was, in a week's worth of time, to come up with a physics demonstration for you fellas, okay, for you folks. And so um, what we have here, I think in the show Iron Chef, there's a whole like ceremony that goes with the unveiling of the ingredients. Is that right? All right, well, we have to have that here. All right, so let me unveil the ingredients. You guys want to squat down for just a second? You guys ready? Oh, come on. Are you guys ready? Uh, our ingredients are the first group will have a paper clip. Come on, I need to hear it. There we go. Our second group will be doing a physics demonstration with an egg. Our third group picked out of all the things they could have possibly picked, a cow. <laughs> our fourth group picked a plastic cup. And our final group picked a spoon. Oh. First up will be the group titled Huge Mess. Henry Hinefield and Tia Klautz, is that right? Yes. Okay. And their ingredient was a paperclip. Let's watch and see what they do. All right, I, can everyone hear me all right? No. Okay. Uh, I'm Henry and this is Tia and we're team huge mess because clearly this experiment creates a huge mess. The uh, kitchen's pretty dirty too. <laughs> we have a paper clip and we're going to use that to show you some interesting properties of a non-Newtonian fluid. What's a non-Newtonian fluid you ask? Well the short answer is it's a fluid whose viscosity is not constant. <laughs> In a little more detail, <laughs> uh, the viscosity of a fluid is kind of a measure of how thick it is, so how hard it would be to run your hand through it. So water, water has a very low viscosity. You can just wash your hand back and forth in it easily. But molasses has a high viscosity because if you stick your arm in some bunch of molasses, you're going to have trouble swishing it back and forth. Both of those are Newtonian fluids because their viscosity stays the same no matter what you really do to them. What we're going to play with today is something that has a viscosity that changes when you apply a changing force to it. We're going to apply that force with this speaker here, and we're going to kind of pump through some sound, and that's going to you know, apply a changing force to the, uh, the non-Newtonian fluid that we have here, and it's going to do some cool stuff, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so just a second. Turn off the lights. It's kind, of, it's, kind of, it's kind of a fluid, but when we put all this force on it, it acts like a solid. I can just pick it up and drop it, and it does interesting things like that. Uh, the frequency that we put it at has an effect, too. Hopefully, with this paper clip, it's a liquid under normal things, but we're going to put a force on it. The viscosity goes way up, so hopefully the paper clip will just balance on top as long as we have this force on it. But turn it off, and it sinks. Next group is titled The Excellent Engineers, Brianna Brighton and Catherine Lusenhoff. Uh, 
Um, hello, friends and family. Um, my name is Catherine Lesenoff, and this is my distinguished research associate, Brianna Byington. And we've got some very exciting findings related to um, eggs to present to you today. Um, so I'm going to start with a, with a question. How many of you like hard-boiled eggs? Most of you, right, because they're delicious. OK, but the worst part of eating hard-boiled eggs is peeling off the shell. But it takes forever, and the little pieces get everywhere. And by the time you're finished, you don't even want the egg anymore. So we've devised a novel, uh, a new way of, of de-shelling a hard-boiled egg. Now, hold your applause. But <laughs> <laughs> so what we have here is an ordinary bottle and uh, uh, an ordinary hard-boiled egg with just the bottom of the shell peeled off. I know you have to do a little peeling, but it's worth it. And um, Brianna here will uh, we'll show you our, our new novel method for de-shelling a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> now, you might be wondering how that works. And uh, the answer is science. Thank you. No. <laughs> the, answer, the answer is that, um, well, when, when we started out and we had the egg on top of the bottle, we had the same pressure, air pressure, inside the bottle as outside. But then when we dropped the paper in, uh, when it was on fire, of course, it started making the air molecules really hot, and some of them escaped. But then when the, when the paper went out, the uh, air inside cooled again, which meant less air molecules inside, because some of them had escaped, means less air pressure inside the bottle than outside, and the egg was actually pushed right in, and the shell was kind of neatly removed, I think. <laughs> Uh, we're, still, we're still in beta, I think, testing this here. Um, I know, Mom and Dad, you've given us a lot of funding for this four-year research project. Uh, we might need a little bit more funding to decide how to get the egg out of the bottle. But, um, uh, we'll do our best. Thank you very much. For some other reason, these fine young individuals decided to take on the challenge of making a demo with the item of cow. And so uh, this team is called The Herd. It is composed of Dan Klein, Kelly Douglas, and Svetlana Morozova. I take full responsibility for coming up with the cow suggestion. It really came back to bite us in the ass. <laughs> so we are The Herd, as you might have guessed from our item. I am Dan Dan, the science man. And these are my assistants, Kelly and Sveta, who are setting up the equipment right now. So what? you're probably asking yourselves right now, what are we going to do with a cow? Well, our first idea was to set up the Monty Python cow catapult demonstration, but we figured there wasn't nearly enough room in here for that. So instead, we turned to something called a cow magnet. What's a cow magnet? Well, if you're not a farmer, let me tell you that a cow magnet is something that farmers feed to their cows so that when a cow happens to nibble on a piece of metal debris, like a, a staple or a nail from a fence post, that will get stuck to the magnet, sitting in the cow's gut, and prevent the cow from suffering massive internal damage. It's a great way to keep your cows healthy and keep them safe from the metal bits that they eat. So what we have here are a series of tubes of different materials. Um, our assistants are going to you know, show them around so that you can verify that these are not trick tubes. <laughs> They are not padded. They don't have any secret little machinery inside of them that's going to mess them up. Good, 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 good. Are we all verified? Sveta, you can come back now. <laughs> so what we have here are first a tube of plastic, second a tube of aluminum, and third a tube of copper. We'll save this one for later. Go for it. We're just going to stick that in the liquid nitrogen, let it refrigerate for a bit. So, what we're going to do now is drop a magnet down each of these three tubes and watch what happens. Ready? Drop. The, first one the plastic tube, the magnet went right through. There goes the aluminum tube. And finally, the copper tube. Whoa. So what's, what's really going on here? Well, as we've learned through years of painful E&M classes, um, 
When a magnet moves near a conductor, it induces an electric current in the conductor. So in these metal tubes, there's a little, little electric current going around and around the tube. And that current creates a force that resists the motion of the magnet. So there's gravity pulling the magnet down, and then there's a force coming from the metal tube pushing the magnet up. And that's why the magnets take so long to drift down. Now, the, the key fact here is conductivity. So plastic is not a conductive material. It doesn't have any conductivity. That's why the magnet just dropped right through like a stone, or like a magnet, I suppose. Um, aluminum is a, is a metal. It's conducting, and that's why the magnet slowed down. But copper is about twice as conductive as aluminum, and that's why the magnet through the copper tube took even longer. Now, it so happens that refrigerating something in liquid nitrogen will increase its conductivity. So let's see what happens when we add in a refrigerated copper tube. And go. There's the aluminum tube, the copper tube, and finally the refrigerated copper tube. So, after all these demonstrations, what's the moral of the story? If you drop your cow through a metal tube, expect it to fall slowly. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, the team calls themselves the Cup Aciders, and it is made up of George Zhang and Chris McKinnon. Hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, my partner here, Chris, my assistant, and uh, my name is George, and we're here to show you uh, very interesting demonstration. So we had the pleasure of having the secret ingredient, plastic cups. And what we have done is added another uh, very uh, rare ingredient, aluminum foil, to uh, construct a very shocking experiment for you. So the construction of this uh, apparatus is very simple. It's just uh, you put uh, one piece of, uh, of aluminum foil on the outside of the cup, wrap it tightly, and then a second piece on the inside. As Chris is gonna make this on site for you, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, this, about the science that's involved here. So um, the construction, once it's done, looks something like this. And this is actually uh, our modern reconstruction of what is known as a Leiden jar. And it's uh, the original form for the capacitor. What it does is it stores uh, static electricity on the, on the surface of the inner foil. And once we charge it up, we can use it to discharge on other objects. And it's a very compact way to store charge. And it was historically very important because uh, a lot of famous uh, discoveries involving electricity uh, were first made using the capacitor. This was invented before the battery. So to show you how this thing stores charge, we're, we're going to charge it up and then touch it to feel the electricity. <laughs> He's going to be the first guinea pig. So what we have here is just a, a static charge generator. And as I spin the wheel, electrons are going to start flowing into the inner foil of the cup and around 10 times 10 to 24 electrons will flow in. And to give you an idea of how big that number is, that's more than the number of stars in the universe and also more than the grains of sand on Earth. So a lot of electrons are gonna start flowing the second I spin this. You sure? Okay. I'll be very careful. Now stick your hand in. Yeah. You sure? All right, that was not enough spins. <laughs> Get the vertical in together. Let's try it again. It worked painfully well right before this. <laughs> All right, I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> All right, feels like that worked. But um, 
I mean, like, I, I think you can be reasonably convinced uh, that we might not be really good actors. Uh, so we want to bring on some uh, volunteers and helpers that will help us do it. But uh, for, for legal reasons, we like to keep it to uh, our siblings so we can do really hurt them. <laughs> Zhang and uh, Molly McKenna, please come up. Let's give my hand. Very brave souls. <laughs> All right, so these are previously charged capacitors. The outside is safe to touch, but the inside will be a little, a little jolt, Thomas. Are you ready? You feel something? OK. <laughs> well, let me let my assistant Chris charge this one up a little bit. As an aside, capacitors slowly discharge after they've been charged. Move that one a little further away. We really wanted to have the full experience. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You gotta touch the inside surface. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing? Let's, uh, let's charge up the other one. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you gotta really touch, touch the inside pocket. And what this does is that it forces the electrons to go through your body instead, and that's how you feel the shock. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you, my uh, lovely uh, assistant. <laughs> Our, our last team uh, was given the ingredient of a spoon, and uh, they have uh, set up a demonstration here, um, which is going uh, to uh, be related somehow to their group name, which is Good Vibrations. Uh, Dan Porter and Katie Harmon. It's going to play a note. Dan, please demonstrate. <laughs> now, we're going to pour some water into this bottle. And do you think the note, so the pitch, is that going to go up or down? Is the note going to get higher or lower? Somebody. Who says lower? Who says higher? All right. Now, let's see which ones of you are correct. Dan? The higher is that higher. So in keeping, you, I guess you're wondering at this point, where does the spoon come in? Um, so blowing in a bottle is lots of fun, I, if I can say so myself. Um, but what we decided to do was actually hit things. Um, and so we decided to hit wine glasses with spoons. That's how the spoon enters into it. So we're going to do a similar experiment that we just did with the bottle, except with wine glasses. We have two wine glasses here. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit difficult to see. Um, but if, if Katie, could you please hit the first wine glass? Mic. Microphone. Microphone. Okay. Okay. So that <laughs> makes a sound with a, a specific frequency, a specific tone. Um, so now if we take another wine glass, if we take the same wine glass or a similar wine glass and put more water in it, what's going to happen? Any guesses? It'll be higher. Okay, let's give it a shot. Just got to find the right wine glass. Hang on. Okay. So one with more water. Here we go. Mike. Oh. So it got lower. Lower. So now what's happening here is when we blow into a bottle, what's happening, the air column is vibrating. So all of the air in between the water and the top of the, the bottle is vibrating. So when we add water, we decrease the possible wavelength and we make the pitch a little bit higher. So 
that's in the bottle case. In the bottle case, it's a, it, the sound is being produced by an oscillation within the air within the bottle. Um, but in the glasses, it's a little bit different. When we strike the glasses, the sound is actually being produced by the glass itself. So the sound is coming from uh, the glass and not from the air within the glass. So the distance between uh, the water level and the top of the glass doesn't matter um, as far as the air is concerned. But what matters is it changes the properties of the glass itself. Um, and so as the water gets toward, or closer to the top of the glass where the vibration is happening when you strike it, um, there's more mass being vibrated uh, at the top of, uh, towards the top of the glass. And so it makes it more difficult. Um, it makes it more difficult for the vibration to happen and therefore makes it a little bit um, lower, right? <laughs> Lower, yeah, lowers what I'm looking for. So I'm going to do a demonstration here. I have a tuning fork, uh, and when I hit the tuning fork, it makes a note. <laughs> if I take these off, hopefully it makes a note. Okay, so there's 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 the one note. Now what I'm going to do is attach these masses to it. Hopefully, fine motor skills. There we go. So. So similar to what's going on in the glasses, um, we hit the tuning fork before and then we add mass to it and hit it again because it takes, uh, it, it has the, the same amount of energy that I'm putting into the system by hitting it, uh, but if there's now more mass to be moved, the frequency goes down. Interesting things with this, and what we have set up here is called a glass harmonica, is that correct? It is. Um, and we're going to play a tune for you that hopefully you all recognize after sitting here today. Um, <laughs> How do you come in and hold above the glasses yes. so as to be able to hear it a little bit better? Should I move it? Nope. Oh, wait, yeah. can, we, can we get rid of this? I'd like to have all the iron physicists come on up here uh, on the stage with me. All right, are you ready? Let's see your clapping. Let's, uh, let's give them all a round of applause.